That's really old. Nineteen seventy three. Okay. I think we're I think we're live. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Alright. Let me know when we're ready. Oh, we're ready. Go for it. All right, cool. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the persistent activity theory of working memory. Um, it has to do a little bit with the fact that I'm thinking a lot about activity and with respect to momenta, obviously I'm thinking about the activity in the, the cortical learning framework. Um, and I have some things to say about that, but I want to make sure that it's understood where it's coming from. So that's why I'm going to do like a quick dive into um, how people think about working memory and what you can still find in the textbooks, but what is changing rapidly and why. So we've had indications that prefrontal cortex is engaged in working memory for a long time from region studies that show when prefrontal cortex is impaired somehow that um, it's particularly working memory functions that suffer. Um, one thing that we should maybe quickly talk about is what do I mean by working memory? So just a cognitive definition of it. Um, like I haven't studied cognitive science per se, so I'm not sure if I can give a proper definition, but the point is you want to disambiguate short-term memory from working memory in the sense that working memory is working memory because um, it is operable, right? You can work with it. Um, it has short-term characteristics in the sense that it is you know, fast learning and low capacity, but it is the, the key point is that you are keeping something active so you can work on it. How is that different short term memory? Yeah, short -term because, memory. Uh, because short term memory just focuses on the aspect that you can buffer some information. Whereas but, then work, I, but then when I, it, the, any information I store in memory is worth more in some sense, otherwise it wouldn't be useful. Oh, I don't know. I, I, like your long term memories might not be workable. Sure, I have a long term memory of what this room looks like and I use it every time I enter here. Right, but then you put it into working memory. Uh, I don't know so if that, I agree with that. Right. So uh, at least the argument. I, 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 I guess I'm trying. I don't know the proper definition from the part of the point of view, but that distinction seems rather artificial to me. At least the the, the cognitive theorists have have made this argument that um, there's a difference to the working memory system in the sense that um, so for example. All the different modalities that have like dedicated subsystems. So, for example, you have a phonetic loop, like a special circuit that is just there for looping, uh, you know, phonetic content, right? So you can think about a phrase or sentence without actually thinking about its contents. You can just repeat its phonemes. Yeah, um, that seems like a pretty that's right. And you have a very, that's sort of a very rare example when someone is doing. Well, I don't know. We have such thing for vision too, like a, it's called the visual spatial scratch path. They call it right. So this idea that you can. Close your eyes, and there's sort of like a, some after image of where is what in the room, and you can think about it. Yeah, but all right, I don't know. I still, I think it's okay. I'll just say that I find the definition uh, distinction. Okay. Um, um, I don't, I guess I'm not happy with that. Right. Okay. So, what I got from you saying is that there are some storage elements that, unless they're brought into working memory, don't have all the modalities we would normally associate with cognitive. Right, exactly. In order to be cognitively capable, these things have to be workable and not just buffered information. So I'm going to be a little ornery here. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of, of moving memory in the brain is, mm -hmm. is false. We don't move memories in the brain ever. Mm -hmm. There are no, it's not like a computer, you don't store something over here. You basically re invoke the same status of activity mm -hmm. under different conditions. Mm -hmm. So at any time someone says, well, we're going to move this into working memory, I go, yeah, it does not, it does not like to me. Um, you don't move memory in the brain. There's no mechanisms for doing that. Well, so, but there are signatures of that process. Well, I don't know. Is there, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's activity signatures of that process. Well, there's right? activity signatures of, of memory, of activity. Yeah, everything is activity in the brain. But the point of that, the idea that, that uh, if you, it's basically to remember something is to uh, take the state of activity of a bunch of neurons and being able to revoke it, we we instate it some other time in the future. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine with that. I buy into yeah, but, but there's no context. evidence whatsoever, as far as I'm concerned, that you actually take that pattern and move it someplace. Um, ah, yeah, that's not how I meant it. That is a too literal uh, interpretation. Well, I, people get of what very, I, say. I think people get really messed up on this because people right. don't understand that and they start talking about these things in ways that aren't right. Now, the physiologist right. wouldn't maybe fool, get fooled by that, but right. so many people. Cognitive. Cognitive theorists, they get filled out all the time. Okay. 
this is a really, really key idea because it really limits the number of ways you could store something. Mm -hmm. um, it's always, it, it's very, very limited. And I think this idea of this sort of looping thing where you're going to mm -hmm. a sequence, that's like a very, that is like the one sort of extreme um, thing. It's not even memory in my mind. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what you call it. But, but that's a very, I disagree that that's a common thing. I think it's very common right. thing. Right. I, I think it just, it's tricky to take these words literally, yeah. right? Well, I mean, can we, uh, in the context of the thousand brain theory, mm -hmm. right, in my course of talks, you know, there's memory that's stored in synapses, that's kind of long-term storage. Right. And then when we're sensing objects and stuff, we sort of invoke dynamic activity that corresponds, let's say, to the set of objects that are possible given the information we have so far. Right. And that's kind of in some dynamic state, and we can in your words, but that's operate not, on it in the sense that we can form right. predictions based right. on it and expectations. Yeah, but the memory is always in the synapse. Like, yeah, but, then, but there's a dynamic uh, state that's associated with what we're sensing yeah, right now. Yeah. And then we can use it to form predictions and expectations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, you can think that, of that, 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 that. But I don't think memory. I just think that when you, you, the brain operates on active states and you invoke active states, then you work on it. But you I know. think that's what he's saying is, yeah, that's okay. why he's defining work. If I understand, that's the I distinction guess, between short-term memory and working memory is really fun to me. Okay. But the distinction between long-term okay. memory and dynamic state that you can operate on mm -hmm. seems very. Clear. I don't know where you're going with this before, but in, I've kind of come to the conclusion a long time ago mm -hmm. that the only way you can store anything in the brain is through changes in synapse, yeah. and um, and sometimes uh, those can be very permanent, like you're growing new synapses, but often they have to be very temporary, and you're changing something about the synapses okay. and. Um, but it's all basically the same type of associative learning. It's just different mechanisms could underlie it. And so, anyway, I guess I react very negative when people start making these distinctions about different types of memory and the right. moving around and all that stuff. Because it is, a, it is a big confusion. I think even neuroscientists have confusion. Okay. Certainly, talking about uh, it. it is clear though that there are brain areas that are correlated with certain memory demands and others that are not. Well, it, it is totally so, possible, in fact, likely that certain areas are going to be. Uh, and I think there's evidence for this. I've seen talks about this, where certain areas are going to be more suited for certain to, to form those very short-term um, synaptic changes in other areas. Right. And like so, the we, and yeah, the cortex. Also, the as well. I mean, I remember there was a talk. I don't know, it was a Cosar or something, some woman talk, and she was describing uh, different sorts of uh, expressions in the pyramidal cells of the prefrontal cortex versus other ones, which allowed them to do this sort of more uh, rapid learning. But it's the same for it's still pyramidal cells. It, the cells express different genes, which yeah. allow them to be more suited for this very short-term uh, right. specific. Right. Uh, right. Don't plan to imply anything else. Um, but the original thinking about working memory is really quite different, um, because following those early indications that somehow working memory tasks tend to be impaired, if you want to think of it in short-term memory, think of it in short yeah. terms of short-term memory. Uh, tasks that require the ability to hold items in memory for some limited amount of time or combine items uh, in, in mind. Again, don't take that literally, they're not literally combining, right? Uh, but in a cognitive sense, combining, right? Um, tend to be impaired when prefrontal cortex is damaged, so people started recording from prefrontal cortex. And so some of the earliest people who did that were uh, people like uh, Joachim Fuster, uh, Goldman Rakic, Funahashi, who've like written all these seminal papers about it. And the early work kind of worked a little bit like this. So you had some behavioral task, right? You had some, some monkey who was looking through like some glass door uh, to look at two different receptacles. Uh, so like there's two sort of uh, doors where you can reach your hand through and then there's two buckets and you lock these doors normally. You lift the screen, put a piece of apple in one of the two buckets, right, on the, for the left hand or the right hand. Uh, so like one of two doors and then you close it again and you wait some delay period and then you allow the monkey to reach through the doors. And obviously the point of this is that the monkey needs to see what happens, right? See where the food got put, but the two doors lock each other, so you can only stick your hands through one of those. So you need to make a choice what you're gonna go for. And so you need to buffer that information, right? About what to do, right? For some amount of time, and then you, you get to act on the task. And then they recorded from prefrontal cortex. And what they showed 
uh, that there are these neurons that respond very strongly to this task in prefrontal cortex, which, um, so the most uh, typical ones, right, the, the ones that people then argued about were sort of these neurons that had a, like a low baseline firing rate, so you see something like four hertz here, which then jumps up to some higher firing rate uh, until such time as the item is to be retrieved, at which case it returns to lower firing. There were different profiles seen. So uh, neurons with a lower firing activity that actually didn't respond to the cue, but was then active over the delay period. There were neurons that ramped up over the cue period. There are neurons that were only active during the cue period. Um, so you see all these interesting state changes, both during the cue and at the signal when the monkey is uh, allowed to act on that information. Right? Uh, so the time scale for these things, you can see it down here. Right, This is five seconds. So every one of these black uh, bars, right, is like a spike counting of different. So this is a single electrode. These were the early days, right, when we didn't have big electrode arrays, and it's just counting the spikes over a time band of I think 500 milliseconds. And they didn't probably didn't say what layer or how far. No, all that you know, all way too there. early for that, right? They were just hoping to find reliable activity, and what they very quickly showed was that it, in fact. There's a strong correlation that you can prove between the ability to do the task, to remember what to do correctly, or to at least to uh, you know, obtain a food reward, um, and the firing in the delay period. So where you could show that there's these units that you can find, where when their activity drops, the, you can predict that the monkey is going to make a mistake. Um, and that holds up under you know, some statistical analysis. And so the idea was, aha, uh -huh, okay, the information is somehow in this activity because we see this activity in the buffering period. And when that activity is disrupted, because it goes away, right? you can be distracted or something, then the monkey fails. So the information is in the activity. That was sort of like the early, earliest interpretation. So I, I always had a big objection to these research. And I, I Keep my mouth shut. I don't know. I'm going to object to a thousand different things here. Okay, so, so I don't want to get ahead of it. But, right. You know, I do this experiment every day. I I make coffee and I put the creamer back in the refrigerator, mm -hmm. and I do it very rapidly. And now I have an idea where it is, and it's different each time. I just put it where I find the pole. Right. And, some, and I'm not thinking about it or tending to it, but I know where it is in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's very similar to this task. And um, one could. Partially, you could explain this as an attentional mechanism, not a memory mechanism. Right. The monkey is just sitting there, damn, I got to get this. I'm just going to sit there and look at this thing because I'm really hungry, thirsty, whatever. I'm not thinking about anything else. This could be a central mechanism, which is countered by the idea that this mechanism, if this activity goes down, then, then the monkey may not perform as well. But that is contrary evidence. But, but on the other hand, it could be that way because I seem to solve this problem every day without attending to it. And I don't think there's people on my floor. You know, in the in the hour and a half between when I make coffee in the first cup and the next cup, I don't think I'm thinking about that much in order to fire it. Okay. Right. So anyway, there are alternate interpretations of this mm -hmm. uh, that can meet the day. Right. <laughs> and so, um, so this idea caught uh, caught a bit of attention, of course, because it was a clear correlate of the of the memory, or at least people thought of it that way. And a lot of theorists flocked to this idea because they knew about all these interesting attractor networks, right? So you know, the, the earliest ones, the, 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 the Hopfield networks, where you just have a couple of nodes, right? And then you can connect some of them and you can get reverberating activity. So the idea being, if you have like two different attractors embedded in a network, and now, you know, one, code, one is coding for the left box and one is coding for the right box. And the idea is that when the queue comes, right, to, to switch on this attractor, then these neurons will activate each other and the activity will keep going around, some reverberant re-entrant activity. So people did this with excitatory nodes of some sort, right? Those were early days, it's not terribly biophysical yet. That came a little bit later when the people did spiking versions of this. And then they argued that, well, the item is sort of kept in storage by the reverberating activity here. And they are competing with another item pool. So there might even be you know, later when people did uh, balanced excitatory and inhibitory networks, inhibitory neurons that are shared and unspecific. So you get these balanced EI networks with embedded attractors, which you can trigger to sort of load that information, right? 
to put that to put those representations in an active state. And then, then you have a very clear case that, well, when you disrupt that activity, the item is gone. That's very nice. And when, as long as that activity keeps going, you are buffering sort of that specific value. You're putting out of all the things that are encodable in this big system with you know, embedded attractors, you are now preferring right, this particular state, but right? you're selecting it. Um, and so people build theoretical models around that. Uh, so let me show you an example. So for example, there's like this Amit paper from 2003. That was before the paradigm shift. Um, and so what they did is they have this nice spiking neural networks, right? And then you have a couple of uh, sort of attractors that you're loading into this. And so what you see is that the activity shoots up from like some baseline to some crazy high number, 30 hertz or something. Uh, which I guess is still defensible for pyramidal neurons uh, during the queue. And then when the queue subsides, the activity stays aloft for a while. And in fact, they even managed to put in multiple items here. You can see that they can put in one, two, three, four items before at the fifth one, the first item starts yeah, dropping out here. This is an attractor, multiple item working memory model. I did not present this one. No, no, but it's something similar to what you were talking about in the past year, how many different responses and based on the dynamics of the right. It's an, and it's an attractive perspective on working memory and it's inspired by this idea of persistent activity, right? So arguing that it is the, it's the activity itself that buffers the item. And now if you want multiple items, well, you're gonna to need to have multiple attractors that are active together. That creates some problem. There is in fact, um, some people even past the, when the, when the controversy got started, got like stuck on this idea. And so you see, papers uh, like this one, which I found outrageously uh, sort of blatant in its violations of biology, um, where they made sort of a nice multi-item short-term memory mechanisms, and they wanted to do it with these attractor networks. And they, they do a lot of nice things. You might remember this, right? So it's like facilitation in this network. These are like spiking neural networks, and you have like these dedicated pools for different items, which that can then be loaded in. And they share an inhibitory pool to balance the network. And you see these, right? These are spiking neurons. So they have an expression for membrane voltage. And there's different transmitters in here, you know, GABA and AMPA and NMDA and whatnot. So it's quite a biophysical model. But then what they do with it are things that are not really seen in nature, right? Where the activity of these neurons jump from like zero hertz to like a hundred hertz when there's a queue present and then it settles in some 60, 70 hertz uh, regime where the items are then maintained active. Um, that is not really what we saw in that data. Obviously we've done since a lot what more. What was wrong about that in the data? Well, so, okay, right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just that. The rates are too high? Yeah, the, the, the rates are way, way too high, right? Okay. Um, so there's a couple of problems with sort of this, this um, perspective. So I, I should start with the things that are most easy to see, right? So in the Fuster targs, right, in 1973. The biggest problem with this, with this paradigm is that you are confounding the memory with the motor response. Meaning when the monkey sees where the apple is put, right, um, he no longer needs to maintain a memory for what he has seen, a memory in the, in the sense that we think of memory in the abstract sense. But instead, what he needs to store is a motor command on which arm to move, and all he needs to do now is withhold that movement. So you have a preparatory motor response. That would be consistent with my argument for attention. Mm -hmm. uh, you're attending to the, to the, the, the box. It has to, which is, is in some sense uh, that invokes a motor command too. So right, the, the, those are both consistent. Right. Um, people did other tasks because it turns out that when you do these big motor tasks where like the monkeys have to move arms and whatnot, you get you know artifacts, and so they wanted to have better control over what is happening here. So they trained monkeys to stare at a dot. This is the ocular motor delayed response task, which became very famous because it. Uh, creates data that is very nicely persistent. 
I'll talk a little bit about why. So you make the monkey stare, stare at that dot, and then you show some, some symbol, I don't know, let's say a triangle in a certain position. And then that stimulus goes away. And the monkey is not allowed to move the eye from the fixation dot, right? But if he you know, keeps focus there, then after some 10 seconds or something, uh, he gets like a signal of some sort, the light goes on, or like the, the signal here changes, you know, to a cross or something. And then he's allowed to move his eyes in a saccade to whatever location the, the symbol was. And then you can do this in various locations, of course, right? And you can show that the monkey can uh, execute this task. So you get rid of the whole arm movement thing, but you still have the problem that the moment when the symbol appears, the monkey can forget all about that symbol. All he needs to remember now is that I'm gonna need to look right as soon as I'm allowed to, but I'm not gonna do that yet. Could, couldn't you do an experiment where there's multiple different motor commands? Mm -hmm. Right. And so people started getting concerned about this problem, right? So this is the problem of the- What do you mean by multiple different motor commands? Like for example, uh, with the original fruit in the box, it could be, you know, you might, you get a later signal that says, okay, you should move your right arm in or you move your left arm in. That's called that a retro that, cue. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. A cue afterwards that tells you what motor commands. You can mm -hmm. act store the actual motor commands. Right. Uh, yeah. So you could make that much more complex. Yeah. So people have come up with slightly better um, ideas how to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you know, you attend to something, then you have a choice of how you act upon it. Right. Uh, but you still attend to it. You still need to remember the location yeah. somehow. Um, so I'm, you know, yeah, yeah. hoping to not have like too much discussion on this so we can actually get through this. <laughs> um, <laughs> it seems to be a tricky con a, yeah, conversation. Yeah, good, so good, good. one of the first things that uh, that that Fuster did here, right? Well, you know, he was concerned about what what is what are these neurons that are switching on their firing uh, actually doing? What are they actually encoding? Are they encoding the space, or are they encoding the the the, the visual memory? Are they encoding the motor command to be executed? Like, what is it actually that is being buffered there? Is that attention, right? Is that inhibition of the motor command to be executed? Like trying to, you know, not move. Um, and so you can you can modify this oculum, oculomotor delayed response task, right? Where you have to move to some queue after some delay period by instead saying, well, you don't, you're not moving to where the queue appears, but you have to move to, you know, 90 degrees perpendicular to it. Uh, and then you can do an interesting analysis in what these neurons that are responding are actually selecting for. And it turns out they are, in fact, actually not so much selecting for the for buffering the memory, they are selecting for the for the place where you're going to move to. So in these in these spike raster plots of like these different trials, right, what you see is that you get high spike rates for a preferred direction, right? You see all the different possible directions where you could do a saccade to, right, and the, the, the eye movement. And in fact, these neurons have a preferred direction. And, and so that is disconcerting, right? Uh, because we, we are apparently confounding, uh, confounding these ideas. Well, again, it's consistent with an attentional mm -hmm. method. It is consistent with- You're to where you're going to move, not what right. you see. That's a good question. Yes. You said the, uh, the one that's required to stare at the dot, was, was, the, was he actually inhibited from moving his eyeball, or was it just he doesn't get the reward? He doesn't get the reward if he moves his eyeball. Okay. Right. He needs to stay at it, or else there's no reward. He lives, he the try gets aborted if yeah. you move your eyes off the fixation bar. Okay, so he couldn't be attending on, I, I need to. Okay, right. 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 It's essentially the same thing that you would do with the arm. You're not allowed to move the arm mm -hmm. until you get the go signal. Like the doors are unlocked now, you're allowed to reach. Except it's a much more controlled paradigm because they're, you know, they're head fixed and you have them very calm and stable, and they're not doing much else. And you know, they can't do anything else with their, right? So you, it's a very reductive paradigm. And that was one of the things that people are obviously concerned about. So the the biggest problem early on was like there's obviously a risk for an electrode selection bias when you only have one electrode and that you stick it in that there's some risk that you are biased towards neurons that are nicely reportable and have strong firing rates. So that is obviously something. 
the influence of the motor planning, how do you disentangle the two? The best way is to actually do a delayed match to sample class so, or like some kind of combinatorial retrofield. Um, there was some concern about the averaging within and across trials, and I'm going to get to that now, um, which is this, this problem of when, when they did, when they found these neurons that were so nicely responsive, you did many trials and you also had these large bins. And the question is, are these neurons actually that persistently active as there are these theoretical models that had like this reverberating activity often at high rates, right? Um, were suggesting, right? The people from physics were very, you know, eager and studying all these state transitions with different attractors and it was like a cool thing to play with. Uh, but the problem is like as soon as people started looking a bit deeper under the hood, so this is probably the paper that started like the big, big revolt on, uh, on the persistent activity theory of working memory was this review by Shafi et al, who took a bunch of different databases from all kinds of different working memory studies. So you all these authors I mentioned before, right, Fusta, Funahashi, Goldman, Rakic, and whatnot. And they took a couple different databases and reanalyzed all of those without all the averaging, uh, without selecting particularly nice electrodes that you can show in a plot where you then nicely see, oh, low fire rate, and it jumps up and goes down again, you know? Um, um, but instead, they looked at all the recordings. And what they found is that A, our, so they tried to classify these neurons into different types, right? Neurons that are, um, delay activated, so they are, you know, um, there's, there's a jump in activity during the delay. Uh, nodes that are stably delay activated, so where the delay go, the activity goes up and stays for a while. Nodes that are delay inhibited, nodes that are ramping, nodes that are non-responsive, and they tried to classify all of them by some metric. And of course, the, the first problem was that it turns out that these neurons that are somehow selective are already in a vast minority. The, most prominent ones are the ones that are really not selective for the memory itself. Um, out of different databases. So looking, this is both looking in parietal cortex as well as in prefrontal cortex. And this is already using more advanced tasks. These are delayed match to sample tasks. So they already get rid of the motor problem. Um, but it turns out that these neurons that people wanted to talk about, these stable delay activated neurons are actually really rare. Um, it might be just like some two neurons out of 900 or 60 recorded. Um, and, and the other thing was that these delta frequencies, right? So the jump up in activity is actually quite low. So here you see like some baseline frequency and then the delta. So what, if they are delay activated, how much higher is the activity during the delay? Well, you can find a couple of neurons that have, that have a very nice jump. But you can see this is a, if you look at the whole data, it's, it's a garbled mess, right? So sort of strengthening like this fear that there might be, you know, selection bias. And uh, they, they went further than that. So they. This is like looking at the dark matter of neuroscience. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so they went, they really went deep down. I'm gonna just like jump to the end here actually. Well, maybe this is worthwhile, right? So, because it turns out when you look at the at many trial averages of a neuron that you found to be nicely stably delay activated, it looks very nice. If you look at the black line here, right? This mean, let me zoom in on that a little bit. Can I go there? There, that's good, right? This mean, the black line, is very nicely low at baseline. And then during the delay activity, it jumps up by a couple of hertz. But when you plot in the individual trials, do you notice something? <laughs> well, there's basic variability observed elsewhere in the brain much earlier, uh, going back to even the bone vehicle and things like that, where mm -hmm. you know repetitive trials, individual cells uh, on an average of many trials can be determined by that individual trial data all over the place. So right. It's not a new idea here. Right. right? It's, it's reliable just, only in the yeah, average. So this, this, this basic effect has been known, I think, earlier. Yes. Uh, they're just applying to this particular case. Yeah. Exactly. Here, can you see some sort of an oscillation? Uh, uh, well, those uh, are, those are the, uh, I that much, yeah. <laughs> So obviously, I'm curious to see whether there's oscillations behind yeah. it because the models that I'm using actually do some oscillations of different type, actually. But the main point is here is several fold. So one is there seems to be a problem with multi-trial averaging. 
right? That you only get this nice delay jump if you average over multiple trials. So you don't really explain the individual trial. The second problem is that there are some periods during this practically always, there's always some period in the delay activated part where you're supposed to have higher, higher firing rate where the activity actually drops below the baseline. Meaning if that is your mechanism for in reverberation to hold the activity, that's where your activity, your, your item is supposed to drop out, but it doesn't, right? Like these monkeys are still capable of doing this task. Um, and then the third problem is you see that there are these very sharp changes where from one time bin to the next, right? Note these are 500 millisecond time bits, which are the binning that people use, like Goldman Rakic and Fuster and like these early investigators. Um, oh, wow. the, the problem is they're changing like rapidly, right? From bin to bin, they're super sharp. Yeah. Suggesting that the temporal dynamics, what is behind that are actually a lot faster then, then these time bins allow for. Maybe to accurately see this, you need like 100 millisecond time bins or even sharper. Right? Yeah. So if you really want to understand what is happening, you need to have, you need to get rid of the multi-trial averaging. You need to get rid of the inter-trial averaging, these big bins, right? And maybe then you would have a chance of like, you know, actually looking under the hood, what is the actual mechanism? Because clearly, the memories, you know, like this argument that the theorists were then making on that broad argument from the average data that it's reverberating activity is quite shaky when you look at these data, yeah. right? What do you think is the right time bin? Um, since I think there's a role for gamma oscillation, the right time bin for me would be something like 10 milliseconds or so, because then you have, then you can resolve 100 hertz oscillations. So you couldn't do that with calcium. No, uh, but you would still get the slower component, the theta right. component. So I, it still has value, I think. Um, so let me just jump to the conclusion of this review document. Um, so a couple of these things I'm going to pick out from here. So one is that the experimentally observed data do not uniformly conform to the characteristics that were ascribed to it, right? This idea that there's some low spontaneous firing rate and some, some large excitatory frequency change from baseline to the memory period, right? That is what these theoretical models were saying in some crazy cases arguing about a jump from zero hertz to 100 hertz. Like the, those were the models that I just found outrageous. But uh, you know there were more there were models that were capable of doing this in a more modest and sensible way. Um, and then this idea that there's a stable, highly structured network, like a subnetwork, which codes for you know these particular this particular memorandum. And then you would have some bistable switching dynamics. So Amit and Brunel did a lot of analysis on that. It's right? very interesting systems to study um, from a physical. But the, the, the data doesn't really show that, right? First, in the, that have all of these properties, right? Because you need memorandum selectivity, right? Rather than selectivity for the place, right? For the motor command, right? You actually want it to be memory specific. So you need some way to disentangle that with, uh, with uh, retro cues or delayed match to sample tasks. Um, you want low baseline frequency. You want large change in firing frequency from baseline to delay. You want reliable inter-trial behavior, right? Uh, and you want a stable structure delay period firing. And then it turns out that holds true for, you know, like some two out of 900 cells or something in, the, in these databases. Um, so that is certainly problematic. Then the mean average firing increase from baseline to delay is like six, seven hertz in the parietal cortex and about 1.8 hertz in, in the prefrontal cortex database, which had a delayed match to sample task. Uh, SDR is uh, uh, some spatial delay response, I think. Um, right, and of course, substantial variability, right? So less than 3% of the responses in the prefrontal database were actually sort of conforming to much of this in the memory cell sense. Um, do -da -do -da -da. So the representations of a particular stimulus with a single stable network state may be uh, both unfeasible and physiologically undesirable, right? So that reflecting the fact that these cells tend to remap, that the code is actually not perfect. 
be stable. There are some cells that might be stable over multiple trials, and then you prefer those when you want to show them. I'm advocating such a theory, but the, the, the question is really, right, what seems to be happening is that even if there were attractors behind this and some reverberating activity, it seems to be like that these things are remapping all the time. And then the question is, how does that work? So more modern analysis um, have, has since shown by there's a nice paper by Murray that actually in the coding space, if you recall from hundreds of neurons there, you find both a dynamic component and a stable component. So you can do some PCA analysis and show that there's some neurons that actually acquire over a couple of trials a very strong selectivity for very specific memoranda. So those are the nice ones that we like. But on top of that, there's a dynamic response which um, which sort of spans a whole subspace, which means that the activity is not really stable in some fixed point, which is what these you know early attractor models would suggest. Well, in today's talk, is, are you just talking about the problems of this? You're not going to talk about solutions. I'm talking mostly about the problems of this. Okay. Yes. Uh, maybe we can get to solutions. No, um, I don't know. Right. So, so this is sort of going towards right the motor planning problem, the averaging within and across trials. That's the big Shafi review. The electro selection bias from the early studies, right? This is like you know, uh, just bigger arrays and being just recording everything, right? Which is nowadays better because nowadays we're just putting these whole databases out there so people can do all this post analysis. Um, there's a theoretical argument from energy efficiency to be made. When your model relies on reverberant activity of very high firing rates, like V entrant loops, right, that keep these going at a very high rate, then you're burning shit tons of energy. Why do that if you can buffer the information also in some small little protein change or, uh, you know, like a little change at a synapse, they phosphorylate some receptors? Um, so th that's just more sort of like a theoretical argument, right? Um, then there's a problem of non-robust maintenance. The problem with these models is that how do we explain that there are, even, even while it's true that there's a correlation between the delay activation and the behavioral performance, so when the delay activation drops, that tends to be correlated with failures in the working memory task. That has been shown across all kinds of different things, but that only holds true kind of in the average. So people have looked at this now, even in humans, Mark Stokes has been doing great work in, in Oxford, um, showing that the activity signatures of these different memory items, they're very nice, you can decode them, they stick out. But when you, when you distract people, right, making this attention uh, uh, intervention, if you give them an intermittent task, if you uh, mix multiple items and there's sort of two tasks that are actually they have to do at the same time or like, you know, sort of intermixed, yeah. Then the activity signature disappears. It can disappear not just for a little bit, uh, but for seconds, right? And then it snaps back, and they can still do the task and the activity. That was my refrigerator. That is your refrigerator, right? It goes even more than that. You know, I remember where I left the shampoo bottle in my shower. This morning. I'll remember that till tomorrow morning. Right. I mean, thousands of things all day long. I remember things all day long. It's like right. you know, it's this idea that we have to keep all this stuff reverberating in our head. From the very beginning, bothered me. I mean, I don't right. believe any of it. So. Well, I mean, like for the long term memory, people were bothered by that too. So they argued that, look, the stuff that sticks around for a long time, you're probably going to do some hippocampal representation or something. But that won't work for items that you're being shown for 200 milliseconds if I have flesh. But I, some again, I just give examples right. where there's a gazillion things like this that are very temporary. They don't stick around for too long, but they still don't have you know, hours of day after day, maybe, you know. Right. Um, and there's thousands of them or hundreds of them that you do in a day. So anyways, so the, the problem with this is that these networks are not really good at robustly maintaining items in the sense that, well, they have nice ongoing attractors, which are strong and reverberating. But the problem is, how do you explain that activity can disappear for some time? And then finally, there's a problem with multi-item working memory. The problem is, if there's one dominant attractor, right, then you can encode one item. And it's a little bit similar to the, the things, the other problems with the motor planning at the electrode selection bias is the simpler tasks where you have to encode only one item and you can prepare for your action. And, you know, when you pick the right electrode, you get these very nice, you know, strong activations in the delay period that goes back to baseline. 
as soon as you you know execute on the task and you no longer you need to hold on to that information. But these things all attenuate when you drop any of these requirements. When you take away the motor pre-planning, you know, you that a delay activity is no longer as strong. When you analyze all of the electrodes, right, suddenly the data is not as strong. When you do multiple items, suddenly the delay activity tends to be much attenuated. There tends to be a lot of pauses and you know, silence in between. So all of these things that move things closer to sort of actual behavioral demands on working memory rather than a, a, a very controlled experimental paradigm, they all diminish the power of this whole persistent activity argument. Um, so a couple few more things to show. Um, so we talked about this big important review paper, which uh, really turned turned a lot of heads. Um, there have been people who've been trying to build synthetic models to explain all these different shapes of all the neurons that are not just uh, stable delay activated. So neurons that would show, let me see if I can find these to actually match them here, yeah. I actually did this. So they tried to take all these different categories that Shafi and L identified in the terms of, well, these are the very nice ones, the ones that jump from baseline to some high delay activity. But then there's also ones that are actually delay inhibited, and there are ones that are delay ramping, and ones that are, you know, uh, like decaying throughout. And can you build a network that actually has classes of all these different kinds of neurons? And with a lot of tuning and a lot of trickery, you can get there, but that doesn't really teach you much in terms of, you know, how the, you know, why, why it would work that way. Um, so people have been doing reviews on this, um, making similar arguments to those that I made from my dissertation. These six problems that I identified actually all exactly from my dissertation. Um, and are writing review papers about this now, right? So working memory, delay activity, yes. Persistency, maybe not. Yeah. That is the timid way of saying it. Um, I, have, in the kind of I have some sympathy yeah. with that. It's the, the problem is, of course, is that all the people who've proposed this and all the people that have built a career on these nice attractor models and studying their dynamics, um, to tell them that they have been not necessarily misled, but that some early selection biases and some early overinterpretation and a bit of unlucky sort of early um, conditions of how we got started on this led us a bit down a bit of a garden path, right? Um, and so they are trying not to offend everybody when they write a, a, a thing like when they write maybe not. I would, they, they, I would, they mean no exclamation mark. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, that's how like, I would write yes, the paper, sure. but again, you know, I'm early in my career and, you know, I can afford to, right? Um, so I, I'm, I have a lot of harsher things to say about any and all of this. That's <laughs> not harsher, right? right. So that's too much. Yeah. <laughs> but things are changing, right? So when, when Marcus and I um, uh, met at the uh, Cognitive Neuroscience Society's yearly meeting right downtown San Francisco, uh, Earl Miller was presenting some of the data that, that they've recorded with multi-electrode arrays with a multi-item delayed national sample class, so getting rid of the motor planning, getting rid of the electoral selection bias, um, analyzing individual trials, getting rid of the averaging with very fine temporal resolution, millisecond resolution across all frequency channels, getting rid of that problem, um, and, um, and doing a multi-item memory task, getting rid of that problem, right? So trying to address all of these concerns at the same time. So it's, you know, a lot more ambitious. And then what they see is that the most informative electrodes, the ones that, you know, are best at predicting task performance and that where with a theoretical decoder can read out the most information and can predict what memory item was, what memory items were actually shown to the monkey. Those tend to be ones that are not necessarily even, you know, persistent in a sense, but they tend to be gamma bursting. So when they look in the frequency bands, they find that the electrodes that have like these gamma bursts tend to be the most informative ones. And these gamma bursts are, they happen sort of like at sparse intervals. You see them like, you know, like a second apart. There's one here at 900 milliseconds and then 
1600, you know, uh, like half a second later, there's another brief burst. And of course, that might explain these sharp transitions that we saw in the multi, in the big bins, right? If in fact, behind the persistent activity, behind this graph, right, with the Q and then the elevated activity and the low, the low step between those, right, let's say four hertz, if in fact what is happening is not that these neurons are jumping for hertz, no, 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 they are jumping to gamma frequency to, you know, like some 60 hertz or something, but they're doing so for a very brief amount of time. So you have these repeated brief burst events instead, buffering the information, mm -hmm. then you will see uh, in the average a persistent increase, but you have lots of periods of silence in between. The information is not in the reverberating activity, but it's probably in some synaptic tension. Right? And so that's why people are now digging up all these uh, synaptic working memory models again, and trying to build models that can, can do this. Right? I'm very proud that I'm one of the very few people in the field who can explain the exact shape of these gamma bursts in terms of the number of spikes, in terms of the different frequency components of it, in terms of the number of bursts per second in the delay period. So like my model matches a lot of the detailed electrophysiological, like the characteristics of this kind of a memory maintenance mechanism. But people are advocating for a new type of synaptic mechanisms now, and they're revisiting, for example, the Mongillo paper, which I showed last time, which had like these sharp population bursts, which not you know, really all that realistic because actually there's multiple spikes in there, not one, but it's at least getting to a signature like this where the most information is actually in the units that are intermittently active at very high rates. Um, that doesn't obviously explain what all the other neurons are doing, but it is interesting that the most informative neurons, the ones that contain the most information about the actual memory item rather than the motor command, rather than about attention, rather than about, you know, the number of items, right, are actually the ones that behave like this. Uh, and so, so that is why I'm interested in uh, these new models, which I guess I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, Mika Lundqvist presented a model that can explain some of this, but is unfortunately not capable of sort of learning these structures that would give rise to that. So they're like pre-encoded in, in his model, whereas I have a way of generating them using a fast associative learning rule, which is why I have an interest in fast associative learning rules. And it's interesting that, you know, dendritic computation might play a role there. So that it's broadening my own lens a little bit. Uh, Momentum strong focus on, on dendritic computation is certainly helping me uh, with that. Um, and so that's pretty much what I wanted to present today. Um, just to sort of like give this, you know, long arch from the, from the 70s, these earliest trials, where we tried to understand working memory, how to wrap our head and pits around and build early models, all the way working through all the big different problems that this has, trying to address them one by one, yeah. right? Uh, to uh, shift in the paradigm, many of the old textbooks Still, if you read the neuroscience textbooks from like three, four years ago, they still talk about persistent activity quite a bit. When you look at the working memory section, that is going to go away. Mm -hmm. I am convinced this is an actual paradigm, and this maybe not is a very is a way of being very careful not to offend the yeah. right people. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Has uh, someone collected data from these gamma bursts and then prepared their cases with respect to each other? Um, oh, I know what you mean. So you mean if there were multiple gamma bursts happening, right. what relationships they have to each other? That is a really good question. I, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, like Miller Lab, they would definitely have data on that. It would be interesting with respect to my model, because my model predicts that if you're going to have these neurons that are like wired together to, to produce these strong bursts, so that they're actually gonna be synchronous inside the mini column. So the gamma is coherent across the neurons in the mini column that share the same selectivity, but they're gonna be slightly out of phase with this sort of like the, this cycle of activation here is gonna be the same, but the individual gamma cycles here might be shifted a little bit. And cycle of activation is like correlated with the same 
yeah, that, that is at least the argument that there is some underlying oscillation here. And when these do occur, they occur on top of, of, uh, of a theta. So the original Lundquist model had sort of this, this observation that either you're going to get sort of like some low frequency beta waves here, which are not information carrying, I found sites of those in macaque, or you're going to get uh, a nested gamma oscillation on top, in which case there's actual information in there and you can read out the memory item from, from those neurons. Um, but again, if that goes into a lot of detail, um, I don't think we have time and it's not necessary. But anyway, I'm, I'm just trying to take from the fact that you think that the information carrying capacity is being, again, worse mm -hmm. than the relationships to each other and the inhibitions that you know, could delay these with respect to each other. Right. Carry a huge amount of information. Yes. So, for example, you can show that the number of these gamma bursts increase with load. So, the more items you put in, the more of these bursts you get. And obviously, there's a limit to how many bursts you can have. So there's like, you know, three bursts a second or something, which roughly matches my model. Um, this is in, in simulations or are you talking in, in? Both in simulation as well as in macaque prefrontal cortex. When you, uh, when you say load in as many things, what does it mean to load in many things? Mm -hmm. So uh, just these, briefly, just say really right, so these monkeys are shown several symbols, yeah. right? And they have to maintain them in order right. to do delayed match to sample tasks with them. And so you can either show them just one item to be maintained so, or two or five. Yeah. There was, I mean, a long time ago, there was a paper that speculated that um, you could, you know, phase shift signals, multiplex signals along, you know, common actual networks. That there's a significance in these phase delays that there's separations between mm -hmm. these things. That means that there is additional capacity on that channel. I mean, that's a very gross argument. Right against the details. Yeah, people show. have been making these arguments. I, I I don't really use that much. For okay. me, these delays in phase mostly come just from the connection delays in the network. as a substantial, particular when you're thinking about the connections that, because what the working memory need, really needs to do is hold on to sensory, uh, you know, representation. So if you have some lasting representation of, of visual items, let's say in, in prior temporal cortex, then you're going to need to sort of control that item to stay active, right? right. So you're indexing that memory of sorts. Um, and that top-down control is very easily tractable with when you have electrodes and like bottle and sort of the parietal uh, um, areas or temporal areas. And you can see those delays. You can see prefrontal cortex leading or lagging the areas that are uh, responsible for the modality of the memory stimulus. Um, so there's actual, you know, top-down, bottom-up dynamics, which are interesting to study, and they impose a lot of phase shifts and uh, and, and delays in that in the in the cortical loop, so to speak. Yeah, kind of a high-level question as we think about kind of the thousand brain stuff and cortical problems. Mm -hmm. In the working memory, most of the literature that's focused on prefrontal cortex and parietal areas right. and stuff like that. But if we think about the cortical column as sort of having all of the different, you know, capabilities that might be you know, useful anywhere. Um, you know, I guess the question is, are there correlates of working memory that would that people have shown in primary sensory areas or in right. you know, intermediate areas and right. things like that? Or is this something that's really very special to uh, you know prefrontal cortex or something? Right. So uh, typically, people make the argument that you can read out the identity of working memory items from early sensory cortex, but you can do so because of feedback projections. Not because the items are yeah. maintained through that, the yeah, I guess that's, that's a cortex. different. That's not quite the level of the mm -hmm. question I'm asking. Okay, it's not like in these tasks do they find things. If it's just right. are there other tasks? If you think about a generic definition of working memory, mm -hmm. you wouldn't expect these tasks necessarily to show working memory V1, right. but there might be other tasks that are more appropriate to invoke working memory V1. Uh -huh. You see what I mean? I, I guess yeah. it's a different type of question. So. Uh, you know, it's like it's kind of this idea of having. <laughs> Jeff looks. <laughs> Jeff, you know, like, let me just finish the sentence. And then, right. yeah, you know, it's more like this definition that you have a dynamic state that's dependent on stored memory, but it's used to operate on on items, right? Mm -hmm. And and has an impact. That's a very generic definition that could very well happen in V1, but you would need different experiments to show that. 
Right. It, it's just generally true that the the areas where the where you find the units that are most multimodal and task specific and have the strongest decoder ability in, in these experiments. In, in these experiments, these experiments, I mean, there's an experiment bias. Here, right. 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 Well, right. Is, uh, right. But people have been doing a couple of different kinds of tasks, right. right? So, like you know, like SDRs and ODRs and different motor response tasks and whatnot. And it tends to be true that in the higher order areas, like people on the you find a lot of units that are very good for decoding, you know, the the, the tasks, the rules, the the items that are currently being maintained. Yeah, but I can think of a couple of experiments that are very analogous, but they show up in V1, you know, the signature. So, you know, like Michael Murray right. stuff, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, uh, I don't. go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, this is like reliving the painful past. Me, so I'm. I'm <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, there's so many things I didn't like about these experiments from the very beginning, and um, and so when people spent all those years analyzing stuff, I think a fundamental flaw from the start is this makes me want to ignore all something. I like to read the data. I like to see the data that you have, but their interpretation might throw out the window. I mean, for example, they talk about it as if these prefrontal areas, this is what they do. This is their job, uh, is to do working memory, which is bullshit. It's yeah. like, it, it's such a complex, big part of your brain. It's modeling the world, and this is a tiny part of it, which is consistent with this idea that what you're really detecting here is momentary attentional mechanisms, not what, so when you look at all these other cells there, and you say, well, how do these cells fit into this working memory thing? They don't. Yeah, it's way you know, too reduction. There's, so yeah. there's grid cells. There's, the orientation so that there's a map going all over the place and they're like they're trying to look at this big you know community of thousands of people and say well this this community sells hot dogs but how many people here you know all these how many people are selling hot dogs no it does much more that's one thing that bothers me mm -hmm. uh, it just talking about and then the whole idea about talking about this is memory i just don't think of it as memory mm -hmm. memory is always in the synapses these are working states of the of the of the brain. So it fits much more likely with the attentional states of what are you currently attending to, what are you currently thinking about mm -hmm. than memory. So I find that whole concept is memory of bottom. Right. And I and I've argued that before. What I think is the big, big thing that's occurred in my mind in the last few years, not stuff that I learned, not that something I did, mm -hmm. is that the working states of the of the system, the active neurons, are Cycle, we have always known that these different cycles that are going on, but the idea that there's multiplex during these cycles mm -hmm. uh, is a we, and which first came up in work, I think, in the hippocampus. But that's like a huge idea, right? There's multiple things happening in time, and they're not just multiple items are memorizing. If you look at the hippocampal um, progression of things that are going on there, it's representing different things that occur through time, through space, and, right. and so there's a, there's, a, there's a big overlapping new idea. That's come about. I don't know how many years it's been. That um, that yes, the, the you got this memory stored in synapses, whether it's permanent synapse changes or these, these uh, genetic or you know these chemical temporary changes, right. and then you have activity states. But the activity states themselves have a much more complex life than we anticipate. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's like a big big idea. That the, oh, that was a whole box of ideas. You really need to look under the hood. You can't. Do just go with Which time rates, you can't just go with spikes. You need to look what's actually happening. Yeah. So membrane voltages and probably not just the summary, but we need to look at the dead rights well, too. Well, more, and more at a higher level that, that, that you know, we could say, you know, people could say, oh, well, the current thing you're thinking about is these neurons that are active. That's what your current mm -hmm. state of active, that's your thought. Um, but in reality, there's a sequence of these very happening very rapidly, and alternating different uh, some of them are active mm -hmm. that represent different things in time and different things in space. It's just a, it's just like there isn't a single state of the brain. Right. Uh, the activity of the brain are cycling through states right. in a very rapid form, and that to me was like the big discovery. You know, that's like the big thing mm -hmm. uh, that I so it wasn't known 30 years ago. Uh, I don't know when it came about, but I only learned about in the last few years. And one of the cool things that has happened recently that I got very excited about uh, work by uh, both Mark Stokes and, and, and Nathan Rose that sort of strongly emphasizes this whole argument that activity is sort of the, you know, like it's like just a like emergent phenomenon of, of, the, of the connectivity really underneath. Um, is these interesting working memory tasks where you show that um, when, when you have these periods, uh, like you, you show some item which can be decoded right, by some means, 
And then you show that that decoder goes back to baseline, so the item kind of disappears. But then when you show an unspecific stimulus, so they literally just show like, like a strong grating pattern or like what Nathan Rose does is the TMS pulse for the brain, like literally yeah. just like <laughs> just blasted with something, right? Any, uh, entirely unspecific. What you see is that almost like um, an impulse response in engineering, where you test a system by putting a pulse yeah. on the input yeah. and you get some understanding of what's happening by then reading the output. Really hard on complex circuits. Right, really yeah. hard. Yeah, but you that's do that when you're in college, okay, you got three, three resistors and a doctor and a capacitor, what's going to happen? Like, right. you know, it's 6,000 elements. You know, right, but the cool thing is it does work because after these unspecific pulses, after just like these strong, um, you know, contrast stimuli, which are, I don't have orientation selectivity here, like for these gap you've shown, um, suddenly the items that you showed earlier, the working memory items, they pop out, they show up again. And so, uh, so that obviously is an argument that the information is still there. And actually it, you can make it visible by having lots of activity. And That's it's not quite the same as pulsing an electric circuit. Uh, you're, yeah, okay. I mean, a TMS pulse is a I know, I know, but you know, thing, when you right? do that in college, you learn the dynamic properties of the pulse, right? Like how right. all the circuits dynamic. But here you're basically, there's several, there are stable states of this neural circuit in the brain. These are the things you remember. Right. And sure enough, you give a pulse, you're gonna remember one. You know, when, when they stick a pulse, a neurosurgeon sticks a electrode in the brain, puts in current, you think of something. Right. That's the same thing, right? right. It's, you don't need a TMS, you just need the nursing. What, what happens when I talk, when I, when, when I do this, what happens when I do this? I want to pick up a dog, I'm picking up a song, whatever. Right? It's the same right. basic idea. Right. Um, I mean, I, I think that's over stretching the, the analogy. Uh, no, but, it, but it, well, yes, but it's just making the broad argument that look, the information uh, is indeed not in the activity. Yeah, it's actually, I, mean, I guess what's so frustrating is that we've said that we've said conclusion decades ago, and, and yet people still. Yeah, but it's it. it's new for working memory people. You have to be the kind. Well, I don't, but them. I don't need to be kind. Of, I can just right. ignore that and go on and figure out the lots of the problems we have to figure out. Why well, don't right. argue about that? Okay, good. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. It's right. fine. It's fine. I just fine. But right. and simply your question, I think you're right. I think that that the work that are working walking in assumptions that every quarter of column should be doing this, and. Um, I think the point I made earlier that there's evidence that in some parts of the brain it's more amenable to short-term synaptic plasticity that require that we would think about the very quick learning, and other parts of the brain maybe less so. That could be like variations. It's variations. Like it's literally that that part I was thinking about. The program was saying yes, we have these layer three pyramidal cells in different parts of the neocortex, and we looked at the gene expression of this particular gene, and we found that that this gene expression is associated with the areas we think are more associated with this quick, um, you know, I don't want to I hate to say the word, you know, working memory, but really um, quick memory or a quick uh, 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 learning of things. So it could be like V1 doesn't learn very quickly and takes a little more time or something like that. And other areas are really, we've already talked about the hippocampus. We know that the hippocampus is more, more memory really, really quickly. And we, we speculated that, that has to be silent synapses. But, you know, there could be, I think there's a differentiation might be going on elsewhere. But I think when we think about the, the method or a cortical column model, it should be included. Uh, we, we can up, the, up it a little bit on one model, down a little bit on another model, but it's, the, I think the mechanisms would be there for every cortical column. That's what right. I would think about it. Uh, so I only wanted to point out to um, whoever wants to follow this, uh, my dissertation has uh, extended part on this, talking about the persistent activity theory, the controversy around it, uh, ways to uh, think about synaptic working memory. Um, how would people find this video? Um, I think Matt already linked out to it uh, a couple of times, but they can also just search for okay. the for the title, of course. Uh, let me just scroll up. Like it's obviously online. Da -da 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 -da. That's the title. That's my doctoral thesis. The talk you were talking about was at the Science Institute. Oh, the part of her name was Veronica Gelbin. I remember that. Yeah. I, I know her. Uh, oh. I, I met her there. So. Did I interpret it correctly? Did I remember? Yeah, no, you're, right. you're remembering. Okay. Yeah, I can't remember what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought it was a really brilliant, I thought it was a lovely talk. And, um, um, yeah. You know, there's this huge experimental bias here. I mean, you can probably talk about it, but mm -hmm. they give these monkeys this task. If this is like, this is what monkeys do, you know, like, have to memorize what's in the bottom of the screen and 
and in reality, it's like it's a forced, constrained, weird old task that we ask them to right. do. It's not entirely it's, unnatural. It's, you know, it's totally unnatural. And right. it, it, you know, it, 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 if you don't mind, there's a, a second digression here. There's this question, there's also this, this conflation between um, typical working memory or typical things I remember. I won't, I won't call it working memory, typical things I remember quickly. And then there's things I have trouble remembering quickly. Like you said, oh, how many you can, you know, this idea that if I give you seven digits, right, or five digits, I have to repeat them over and over in my head to keep, keep them straight. And um, well, um, uh, and this is this passes through a little bit like that too. You know, I have to remember two things on the, on the space where they are. Right. But but one thing we've learned with the thousand memory theory is that our memory is easy, it, much much easier if you have a reference frame to store it. Right, so why is it easy to remember where the milk is in the refrigerator, where the shampoo is in my shower, and where I left the toothpaste last time I used it? Because all of those have a reference frame that I can easily place that item in. Mm -hmm. When right. I give you seven digits in a row, there is no reference frame. Uh -huh. And well, uh, unless you do a memo techniques where you know that you know the oh, seven right. is always your uncle on the yeah, I know, that's, that's, that's a trick, right? Yeah, that's right. a trick. But without that trick, yeah. um, it's very, very hard. And right. this task here. These, these intentional tasks, these intentional tasks are kind of, you might argue, well, there's a reference frame, but not really. There's no logical way that I would want to, there's nothing in the world that, that, that I need to remember where the green triangle is, the red square, and you know, it's really random. Yeah, the, like, the problem is that these tasks don't mean anything to the monkeys. Yeah, right? well, also, but I'm, I'm phrasing it in a way, I'm phrasing that these are unnatural in the sense that they have no uh, reference frame that we would typically associate these things with. So, right. So, and people, I didn't under, I always knew there was a distinction, but I could never put my finger on it. But now I can put my finger on it. The finger is, it's got to have a reference frame. Mm -hmm. And if you have that reference frame, like milk within the refrigerator, refrigerator is a reference frame. It's real easy if you remember where I put it there. Right. If you said, okay, the milk is going to have some number between one and 50, and the shampoo is going to have another number between one and 50, and wherever I left my D list, it's another number between one and 50. I would have no concept. No I mean, that, that. that in itself, um, if I can take that a little bit differently, right, um, is, is a common problem in neuroscience, this idea that um, we are working with, um, how do you say it, like naive animals. The, 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 the problem is that we are either uh, overtraining these animals on a specific task, so they, so they learn to execute the task, but don't have sort of the, the, the normal cognitive behavior on it, like they're automating everything. Yeah. Uh, or we insist on this idea that uh, they must be naive animals and they don't know anything about the environment and uh, they're completely out of context and it's an artificial environment that is not natural to them where they have no link, no reference frame. Yeah. Right? And so that is a common problem in neuroscientific investigation, like to, to, to hold that balance and typically don't think about it. They just do whatever is experimentally convenient. Well, I think that's okay because, you know, we are limited by what we do experimentally. So I don't have an objection to these experiments. I think it, I, my objection is the interpretation. You right. know, to say, oh, well, we know that prefrontal cortex, you know, we read these papers, prefrontal cortex is responsible for working memory. Like, what do you mean? I mean, that's, that's not all it does. I mean, it's a teeny little thing it does. Right. And and then they'll and then they, and, and then you point out this is the only thing we can do. So we look for all the neurons to do this. Right. Right. All the neurons have to somehow correspond to them. I think it's like crazy. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know I think I can blame people. I can be upset about that part. Um, I think the experiments is very hard in these experiments, and so you know the, we should collect the data. But I just wish wish in all these papers they wouldn't try to make it sound like they know what the hell is going on. They should they saying these are all the kind of list you made here. We know all these things are wrong. So what can we extract from this? Like you said, extracting out those spike trains and say that's the interesting thing in here. Yeah. It's not that they're we're trying to make all the spike trains match this task, but when I do this task, I have all these real spike trains. What could that you know that would be the right interpretation of that data, I would say. Um, and I'm just you're yeah. touching on sore points to me because yeah sorry for opening old wounds there. <laughs> well, I, mean, I mean because in some sense it'll probably happen, happen again, don't worry. But, you know <laughs> To achieve what we've achieved here, I've had to sort of navigate through these minefields for decades. Um, and, and talk to people who just totally dis disagree with me or, you know, they don't want me to say what I say. Or, you know. yeah. well, I'm really interested to see how these kind of mechanisms can help us in the, in the Oracle column model. Right. Uh, and exactly. keep thinking of, you know, unions and how the, right. you know, all the 
limitations we have with that. So right, so one of the problems that I have with you know, with unions is just like these these massive activity that that would correspond to if you take it literal as actual neural activity, right? And is there a way to get around that? For example, by you know multiplex multiplexing hypotheses mm -hmm. uh, in uh, so here's the problem with that. Space. I agree this is an issue, but I don't mm -hmm. understand it. Imagine the voting mechanism between columns, right? Mm -hmm. Well. Fine. So let's say, okay, that requires a union so that everybody can sort of resolve at the same time. But we say, well, what if we multiply them through time? Well, then if I multiply them through time, can I still get it to work? Because how do I know that, you know, if you're doing A, B, C, I might be doing B, C, and A. Mm -hmm. And so at any point in time, we're not actually lined up. You follow what I'm saying that? Yes. And so how can, is there a way of getting around that problem? I think if you could somehow, all these guys can multiply through time and have, um, multiple representations going sequentially, if I can still get the voting to work, uh, I'd feel better about it. And right. I think it's possible because um, if you allow a slightly longer time window than five milliseconds, for a data know, like integration. milliseconds or something like that, then you could imagine the way we, one way we thought about doing voting is we have these active dendrites that, you know, find, trigger these patterns laterally. Yeah. And then when you actually get input, the depolarization biases the ones that have the most evidence. Um, yeah. Right? And so, but if these things are multiplex, if it's fast enough, the depolarization lasts for 100 milliseconds or more. And so the voting could still work just fine um, in that kind of in a, in, a, in a 100 millisecond or 200 yeah, milliseconds. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Or 50 milliseconds, whatever. Yeah, it wouldn't okay. be five milliseconds. Well, the, I mean, I think the depolarization are sort of a couple hundred milliseconds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, some metabotropic um, activations. Well, I think that's an interesting. I mean, I think that's a very good way of thinking about it. I mean, I, I you know, the union property has this appeal to it, a very, um, very deep appeal to it. It, it, it deals with a fundamental problem, just like sparsity does. Right. It just has these things about it that you say, well, this has to be right at some point. Right. But the mechanisms for it could be trickier. Right. And that is what I'm a little bit concerned about. Yeah, so so uh, I'm I'm totally I mean I'm not wedded to the idea all these things all acting at the same time, but conceptually they are. Right. Yeah. And so mechanistically, well, this would be like within like if you integrate over fifty or hundred millisecond, if you have those bins, then you would see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah so so that's that's a great. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good outcome for today. I don't know if we've ever discussed that before. But I don't remember. Um, yeah, that's new to me. The the active dendrites combined with. I hadn't thought about that, the, the multiple dendrites that cause the longer time span allows yeah. you to vote well multiplex. So we want, we want to keep the union idea, but the mechanisms underlying it can be kind of tricky and messy and so on. But I don't, I mean, it's just too compelling an idea to go away from. Yeah, for sure. No, because you want to resolve the, the hypothesis space, right? Because we know that we're capable of that yeah, and yeah, we know yeah. that that was quick. Yeah. So it all works. It's really interesting in the short term plasticity. Mechanisms can can help with that, like right? This. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is and so that's what I want to think a little bit about uh, in the coming weeks. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and I guess it's going to be a couple of conversations with with Jeff. But the whole reason why I wanted to put all of this out there and talk about these things is because I want to work as many of you, you know, possible into this conversation. Yeah. I know that we're yeah. a bit busy with other things, but um, you know, I, I also no, care very good. much for this framework. And if we can advance it a little bit or like branch off an interesting idea that might develop into something, I think that's, that would be I great. Think on a very, this would be a very important thing. If we could explain um, the, the physics of, of the, the union properties and its, and its operations in a, in a, framework of, um, a framework of oscillations. And I also want to wrap in these, you know, this idea that I have about um, oscillations related to scaling. I think that's important too. So there's a there's a whole I I kind of I hinted at it moment because there's a whole world of things opened up when I realized that you got this these um, these oscillations in the in the, in the, the multiplexing with the, through them and mm -hmm. and um, so I, I brought a theory about that. Um, it seems to be a, a really important next step um, in, in all the whole thing. I can still talk about unions as if they were, uh, as if they were just working the way I talked about them, but yeah. under the cover they could work slightly. Right. Awesome. I'm very excited for the future. Okay. And I'm glad you are too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Right. Right. On that note. <laughs> on, that, on that note, I guess we can end this today. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. We can also on offline that.
Hey everybody, thank you for uh, for watching today. I uh, appreciate you. Um, I gotta leave this meeting. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining. Um, we do these research meetings pretty much every week. I think we're trying just to do two a week right now. These are our our real research meetings, so um, they may not make sense sometimes. We just kind of Jeff just started letting me live stream them, so. Um, glad that there are 20 people online watching. Uh, appreciate that. Please give the video a like if you don't mind. Um, it helps. I want to. I want as many people as possible to watch these. And just the fact that there's 20 is outstanding because this is like pretty detailed neuroscience stuff. You know, um, you've got a PhD of neuroscience talking to you about very intricate details about uh, heavy learning, uh, when types of memory. Um, so interesting content, right? So thanks. For watching um come back and, and watch us later i will have another stream i think monday and so i will see you then and there will be a podcast coming out if you like these series of talks with florian um i have a podcast coming out with him um we talked for 40 minutes or so i think uh and uh should be out by the end of the month i just have to do all the editing and everything so you'll see that soon um eric Falco, Charles, uh, I was talking to someone, Johnson, uh, Doug Rose, Nick Kay, uh, Mark Brown, thanks all you guys uh, for jumping in on this, uh, Matthew, um, and uh, take care, and have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend. I am signing out, talk to you later.